Hey everyone, I'm Liza from Girls Who Code, and today you're going to meet a new programming platform built specifically for artists, designers, and beginners. Allow me to introduce P5.js. In this video, we're going to explore the environment and learn the basics of P5.js. You'll learn how to set up your account, use the online editing environment, create and save sketches, use functions, and finally, we'll talk about how to conceptualize something called program flow to understand how your program is running. Let's get started. Step one, meet P5.js. P5.js, or just P5, allows you to create interactive art for web browsers. It's a tool for creative coding, which we can think of as projects that use code for expression instead of just functionality. But before we dive in, I wanna share some of the platform's history. Let's think all the way back to the early 2000s. A team at the MIT Media Lab wanted to build a coding environment that more people would want and could use that was especially tailored to beginners and artists. They eventually called the platform Processing, and two graduate students, Ben Fry and Casey Reese, began the project in 2001. Now flash forward to 2015, a team led by Lauren McCarthy started a web version of processing that uses JavaScript. In fact, P5.js is actually a library for JavaScript, and JavaScript is a programming language that allows you to add interactivity to the web. So being a library means that P5 is JavaScript, but the creators made a collection or library of specialized functions, methods, and variables so you don't have to do everything from scratch, which is pretty cool. You can find all of these on the P5 reference page. And since P5 is web-based, it makes it super easy to share your work with the rest of the community. Speaking of community, you can read more about the origins of P5 and the amazing group of people who contribute and build with this tool on the P5 homepage. You can check out their shiny new showcase page to see some example projects that people have made with it. Everything from data visualizations to games to art, music, and installations. We've included all of the links for you below and in your tutorial. Step two, create your account. So there are two ways that you can use P5.js. The online web editor or a text editor and a copy of P5.js that you download to your local computer. The easiest way to get started with P5 is the online editor, and that's what we'll be using. This allows you to write code and run your program in a web browser. So in this tutorial, we're just going to use the web editor to reference steps and illustrate examples. If your internet connection is intermittent, or you would rather work in an editor locally, you can explore the second option. You can go to the Getting Started page of the P5 website or find the link below in the notes. So to get started with the web editor, first you need to create an account. Go to editor.p5js.org slash sign up. First, you want to fill in all the fields, create a username, email, password, and password confirmation, then click sign up. Alternatively, you can choose to sign in with Google or GitHub if you have one of those accounts. Next, check your email. You'll receive an email to confirm and verify your account, and you should definitely check your spam folder if something doesn't show up in about three to five minutes. Once you get the email, click the link and then sign in with your new username and password. Finally, most importantly, save your credentials. Put your username and password in a safe place so you can log in again. But if you do forget, you can always go to the login page and click reset your password at the bottom. Then the P5 platform will send you an email to reset it. Step three, explore the environment. Now that you have an account, let's examine the interface of the P5 online editor that's on my screen. This is an IDE or integrated development environment that allows you to write and run programs in one place. The programs written in P5.js are called sketches. You can think of this environment like a sketchbook, but it already has all the tools included. Let's start with the toolbar. At the top of the page is the toolbar. It has four different drop-down menus, File, Edit, Sketch, and Help. In the File menu, you can create a sketch, save a sketch, duplicate a sketch, share a sketch in multiple, multiple formats, download sketch files, open a sketch, and open examples. It's important to note that some of these options won't show up until you actually save your sketch. The edit dropdown allows you to do things like tidy your code, find a character in your sketch, or navigate through the words that you're looking for in your sketch. 
In the sketch menu, you can add files or folders to your code and run or stop your sketch. In the help dropdown, you can find really handy keyboard shortcuts, a link to the P5 reference page, and more about P5. So here's a quick list of the keyboard shortcuts. You don't have to use them, but they can really help you perform actions more quickly. And if you use a screen reader, these will be super helpful to navigate around the IDE. Below the toolbar is the sketch information. On the left is a play button and a stop button. The play button starts running the program and the stop button stops the program. You can check the auto refresh box if you want the program to keep running after you make changes instead of having to click the play button every time. To the right, you'll see a pre-populated title for your sketch. To rename your sketch, click the pencil icon and type in the new title. You can access the settings by clicking the gear icon to the left of the sketch information. In here, you can change the theme, text size, and accessibility settings, which we'll talk more about in a minute. We highly recommend that you turn on auto save here in general settings though. Up next is the editor. This is where the magic happens and you write your code. Each line has a number so you can easily reference it. Use the small arrows next to a number in order to collapse the text or uncollapse it. So for example, if you have multi-line comments, you can collapse those if you don't want to see them. What you write in the editor will display in the preview window when you run the code using the big play button. Below the editor is the console. This window prints information about your program. This could include error messages, or data that you want to access in a program, like the value of a variable. So let's talk about accessibility in P5.js. P5 developers have placed a really high priority on making the editor and the preview window accessible to those who are visually impaired. These tools are in active development and are part of a larger ongoing research project hosted at New York University. If you require a screen reader, know that the online editor website and the editor itself are readable by screen readers. You can update the accessibility settings by clicking the gear icon. We recommend turning on the lint warning sound, which alerts you to errors that prevent the program from running, and to check the boxes under accessible text-based canvas. The HTML element that displays the executed code in the preview window is called the canvas, and this is a more opaque HTML element that screen readers can't usually access. As a result, much of the accessibility research and development has focused on making the visual output in the preview window readable by a screen reader. Currently, you can access this functionality through the p5.accessibility.js library. This library works best with the following pairings of browser and screen reader, or screen reader and browser in this case. Uh, the first is NVDA and Firefox, and the second is JAWS and Chrome. At this time, though, the functionality is not supported on Mac, so you'll need a Windows or Linux machine. Uh, we've included a link to how to use this functionality in the notes below or your tutorial. If you have low vision or are partially sighted and don't require a screen reader, choose the high contrast theme and increase the text size and settings. So as you continue to learn how to program across different languages and platforms, you should always keep accessibility and inclusivity at the forefront so we don't have to do things like develop libraries and plugins for existing platforms. Historically, designers, engineers, and programmers don't prioritize people with disabilities as they created the software and hardware that we use today. With the rise of facial recognition software and other software, this also applies to people of color, women, and other marginalized communities since the implicit biases of programmers translate to their code. This is beginning to change as awareness increases, but there's still a lot of work to be done, and that's where you come in. So remember to take the time to ensure that everybody can use what you build. Step four, examine how P5 functions make things happen. So we can define a program as a set of instructions that you create for a computer to follow. Instead of writing the same instructions over and over, we can group instructions into chunks so we can reuse them later on. These chunks are called functions. Functions are lines of code that perform a set of actions. You can think of them like verbs. 
they do something like draw a circle or listen for a mouse press. In P5, we give instructions to our program in the form of functions. Most of the functions that you will use are defined in the P5.js library. You can also create your own functions, but we're not going to cover how to do that here. When we use a function, also called calling a function, the program runs the code inside it. For example, one of the most important functions is the create canvas function. This function creates the canvas element that draws the graphics and displays the sketch. In other words, it determines the screen size. But how do we tell the function what screen size we want? To do this, we pass parameters through the function to get the output we want. Parameters are input values that the function uses to execute the function. Let's examine the syntax of the create canvas function. Create canvas, open parentheses, width, comma, height, close parentheses, semicolon. Create canvas. This is the function name. Parentheses. We use parentheses to tell our program that it needs to call the function. Sometimes we include parameters or inputs in the function inside of our parentheses. Width. The first parameter that sets the width of the canvas in pixels. Height. The second parameter that sets the height of the canvas in pixels. Semicolon. All lines of code in P5.js must end with a semicolon. The parameters set the dimensions of the canvas in pixels. Pixels are graphic building blocks of digital screens. You've probably heard of them. Each pixel represents a single point on a screen and has a single color. You will need to include this function in every P5 sketch. Here, we have a P5.js web editor running the default code displaying a 400 by 400 pixel canvas that appears as a gray square in preview. So let's practice. Try changing the parameter values to resize the canvas. First, open the P5 web editor and log in. You may have noticed that the sketch came pre-populated with starter code, including our friend create canvas. The default size of the canvas is 400 pixels wide and 400 pixels high. Click the play button to run the code. Notice the size of the canvas that displays in preview. Next, try changing one or both values, then click the play button to run the code again. Check the auto refresh box so you don't have to hit the play button after each change you make. All right, so go ahead, pause the video and add your code to the sketch. Restart the video once you've completed all the tasks above. Welcome back. When your code runs, a gray box the size of your parameter should appear in the preview window. This demo sketch displays a 500 by 200 pixel canvas that appears as a gray rectangle in the preview. Step five, learn about program flow. So we know how to give our program instructions, but where do we put those instructions? When do they run? Does the order of those instructions matter? And can functions go inside other functions? So all of these questions relate to program flow. And this refers to the order in which the program runs your lines of code. In P5.js, the program runs each line of code in sequence. This means it runs the first line of code, then the second line, then the third line, and on and on for the duration of your program. So later we'll learn how to control your program flow with conditionals, but first we need to know about two core functions in P5.js, setup and draw. Setup. So what is that? The setup function only runs one time when your program starts, just once. There's only one per sketch and it cannot be called or used again after the first time. So what sorts of things should you put inside it? You can put any functions that you want to run immediately when the program starts, like setting your screen size with Create Canvas, uh, adding a background color sometimes, there are other times you might want it to go and draw, and to load media such as images and fonts right when the program starts. Remember that if you create any variables here, you won't be able to access them in draw or any other functions. Draw. So what is it? The draw function runs the lines of code contained inside its block continuously until the program is stopped. This is the main loop and it's where the action happens. There's only one per sketch and it's called after the setup function. What should you put inside it? 
anything you want to happen repeatedly. Remember, that's the key word here, repeatedly, continuous, in a loop. So to get a better understanding of the differences between them, let's examine how a sketch changes based on we, where we put the background function. So this function sets the color used for the background of the P5 canvas and can take many different color value parameters. But for now, let's just say we're going to pass a single value between 0, which is black, and 255, which is white, for a grayscale color. Let's take a quick look at the syntax for the function. Background parentheses, value, close parentheses, semicolon. So background is the function name, parentheses. We use parentheses to tell our program that it needs to call the function. Sometimes we include those per we include parameters or inputs within those parentheses if our function requires them. Value, a grayscale value between 0 and 255 where 0 is black and 255 is white. Semicolon. All lines of code in P5.js must end with a semicolon. So where do we put this function? Do we put it in setup or draw, and how do I know? Placing background in setup or draw will yield very different results. So let's consider this code. Right now, this sketch does not have a background. In the setup function, we created a canvas that is 400 by 400 pixels wide. And in draw, we created a circle or an ellipse to the screen at the position of the mouse. Since the ellipse function is in draw, our, progr our program paints a new circle to the screen each time the program loops through, which is about 60 times per second, uh, forever or until we tell the program to stop. So consider these sketches. One has the background function in setup, and one has it in draw. You can find the links to them in your tutorial or in the notes below if you want to try this out yourself, and I recommend that you do. When we move the mouse over sketch one, the circle follows the mouse and leaves a trail of other circles in its path. When we move the mouse over sketch two, the circle follows the mouse and does not leave a trail. So which sketch has the background function in setup? And which sketch has the background function in draw? And why do you think that is? Pause the video to think about it. Restart the video to check your answer once you have your hypothesis. Welcome back. Let's check your solution. Sketch 1 has the background function in setup. This means that the background is only drawn one time. Since the ellipse function is in draw, P5 draws a new circle at the mouse position on the screen every time the program runs through a loop. You could describe it like this. Build background, draw a circle at one position, draw a circle at another position, draw a circle at another position, draw a circle at another position, and so on and so on until the mouse stops. Sketch two has the background function in draw. This means the program draws the background and the circle every time the program loops through. This gives the appearance that the circle moves smoothly through space as we move the cursor, even though the program is drawing new circles just like in the first sketch. You could describe it like this. Fill background, draw circle, Fill background, draw new circle, fill background, draw new circle, fill background, draw new circle. So that wraps it up for program flow and this video, and we hope to see you back for part two.